Okay, uh, we're very fortunate and uh, happy to have with us today Dr. Steve Wussinger, who is with the uh, University of Hawaii Manoa uh, Meteorology Department. And he has, uh, among the many things that he does as part of his uh, teaching and research um, activities, he also, his team does the um, forecasting, the weather forecasting for the Mauna Kea Observatories in the summit. But he also has been doing research for us over the years, and this most recent one that we have collaborated with him is this climate downscaling, which is a development of modeling for um, climate change in on the summit for the next over the next 50 years. Thank you very much, Steve. I'll turn it over to you. Shall I just stay seated, or shall I go up front? The idea behind climate downscaling is that when you have a climate model, because the model has to run so far into the future, 100 years, say, to 2100, or 60 years to 2050, or 2060, uh, it can't run at a resolution that can resolve <coughs> Mauna Kea. But we run a weather model every day on Mauna Kea at very high resolution, down actually 250 meters, and we can calculate things like uh, how much optical turbulence there will be for the telescopes or cloud cover, whether it's going to snow or not at the summit. And so the idea is why don't we take the climate model output and use that as the initial condition for the weather model and run a high resolution weather model that can resolve Mauna Kea and then look at what is the weather doing in 2050. And that basically is what we've done. So my collaborators here are Tom Robinson and Andre Patantius. Uh, Tom did a lot of the initial runs and, uh, and then promptly got a, a, a position at, I think it was NASA, and left, um, which, which does happen occasionally in, the, in our uh, effort to do research. Very talented guy, and he just got uh, 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 lured away. Andre Patantius took over, and in the meantime, some of the runs, which were being kept at the Yellowstone supercomputer in Wyoming, uh, disappeared because storage is a premium, and all of a sudden, so Andre had to rerun some of it, and, and as a result, these, the, 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 there had been a bit of a delay in getting this back, and Stephanie's been very patient with me. Uh, but finally, uh, hot off the press, we have uh, some results. And this little graphic I'm going to actually show again, and I'll talk about what it, what it means. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to do is just give you an introduction to some observations. This is not model results. This is for the summertime in the U.S. mainland from 1950 through 2012, and basically what you're doing is looking at the temperatures and subtracting the climatology of the last 30 years and showing how that's changing. And uh, basically, you can see that there's been a shift in the climate. And this is observations, and I think it's kind of compelling. It's summertime uh, when actually the warming is most apparent, and we see that also at Mauna Kea. Here's another one. This one is starting in 1800s, and it's going to 2012, or no, 2016. <coughs> and it just basically plots the monthly average temperature of the globe, as we, we can best uh, determine what that is. And you can see there's a pattern here, and it's just a way to visualize the global warming that's taking place. So. We understand that global warming is associated with greenhouse gases, and greenhouse gases absorb radiation from the Earth, warm up the atmosphere a bit, and then re-radiate that, that heat back to the ground in, in terms of infrared radiation. And where does that added heat from carbon dioxide go, or from greenhouse gases go? And it turns out that most of it goes into the ocean. That's where most of the heat is going. And so the atmosphere is, is, is uh, warming very, very slowly. But the, and, and the ocean, because it's so large and has such a large thermal mass, the, the, 
uh, heat capacity of the ocean is very large. It, it's warming very slowly. But that's where most of the energy is going. It's going into the ocean. And that's one of the reasons why the Arctic ice is, is melting. And this is showing the temperature trend since 1980 from uh, satellites. Uh, and you can see that it's, it's gradually warming. Now, that has an impact because the dew point temperature in the atmosphere above the ocean surface is determined by the ocean temperature. The dew point temperature is how humid it feels. Now remember when we had this El, El Nino, this is the, the water vapor associated with the last El Nino back in 2015. Really humid weather we had here in Hawaii, in part because of the fact that we had such warm sea surface temperatures, anomalously warm sea surface temperatures in the Pacific. And that's a trend, and that trend of course, well, during El Nino, we had a lot of tropical cyclones in our vicinity. This is a mosaic put together by Kevin Kadama at the Weather Service. Really amazing, 15 of these tropical cyclones was swirling around us. Some came very close. By 2075, this is a, st a study that I didn't do, but it was done in my department. The expectation is that we'll get about two more tropical cyclones passing near Hawaii than we do currently. The reason for that is that the maximum intensity of, of hurricanes is shifting away from the poles a little bit with, with this warmer climate. So we're getting hurricane tracks that are tracking just a little bit further north. Currently, or in the past, the hurricane tracks have primarily been to the south of the Hawaiian Islands. So this is going to influence us. And we'll see that in some of the results that I'm showing as well. So that last thing was a model output thing. All the other things that I've showed so far are observations. This is an observation. And it's done by Tom John Baluka. And he's got a number of stations uh, throughout Hawaii at high altitude. And he's taken just the high altitude stations here and plotted them uh, from I guess the early 20s to uh, 2010. So some, some of these are not his stations, but, but uh, meteorological weather stations that have been in Hawaii for a long time. And you can see that there is a trend, especially in the last 30, 40 years, of, of warming temperatures. And we see that at Mauna Loa as well. There's been a bit of a warming trend, Mauna Loa. Less so at Mauna Kea. And again, these are observations from the Mauna Loa Observatory from 1970 through about 2010. Uh, one of my graduate students did this, this work. It was an early study that, that uh, Stephanie helped support um, looking at the summit temperatures and uh, climate. And what about precipitation change in Hawaii? This is one of Tom John Baluka's rain gauges. Um, and this is, again, Based on observations from 1920 to 2007, we see that there's a trend, a drying trend, uh, for the most part on the leeward side of the Big Island. And uh, nowhere is it really getting wetter, but it, it does seem like uh, in, in the windward side, it's staying about the same. <clears throat> if you just look at the trend from 1978 to 2007, however, you see more of a, a drying trend. So what is going to happen in the future? Oh, I guess one more observation slide here. This is again is from Tom John Baluka. Warming trend at the top for temperature. Uh, this one here is solar radiation. So the amount of sunshine is going up. It's getting brighter. And then this is the number of zero rain days in the dry season. And so it uh, is showing that it's getting drier. These are observations, again, and it, and it does create uh, impacts to the ecology. <clears throat> so one of the things that I wanted to study in looking at this model downscaling is looking at the trade wind inversion. You've probably heard that term before. What is a trade wind inversion? It's basically where the temperature starts going up as you go up in the atmosphere, and that creates a cap because warm air rises and cold air sinks. So if the temperature aloft is warm, which it is in Hawaii a lot of the time, when we have trade wind weather, uh, then 
the clouds from uh, down below where the moisture is of, uh, at the ocean surface, they're, they're limited. And this trade wind inversion caps those clouds. And that's one of the f you know, factors that makes Mauna Kea such a great place for astronomy. The fact that we have this trade wind inversion and we tend to have uh, clear, dry conditions above. Now, the bottom of this cloud layer is called the lifted condensation level. And it's basically, if you take air from the ocean that is humid and you lift it up, the air expands and does work and the temperature has to drop. That's the first law of thermodynamics. So the temperature drops and eventually you get the 100% uh, relative humidity or saturation and you develop a cloud. So that's the cloud base. And you can calculate both of these in the weather model. And that's what we've done, one of the things that we've done in this study. So let's look at some of these uh, results that we have running the model. And we, we have 10 years of data that we can then plot, 10 years of running the model every day. And we can plot then the minimum temperature, which is this, this line here, that's minimum temperature, that's the, the mean temperature every day, and that's the maximum temperature every day. And then these funny excursion things, those are the extremes. So during that whole decade, what was the lowest temperature on a particular day that ever was ever reached? And you can see this is like the absolute lowest temperature, uh, minus 15, and then you can also see what the, the maximum excursions were as well. So this plot gives you uh, a nice quick way of looking at extremes and means for the whole period. And this is the same thing only done with observations. And this was done uh, by my student uh, Sarah De Silva and this is the latest study. You can see they're shifted a little because here's the zero line and that's the zero line. And the scales are not exactly uh, the same. <coughs> Basically, the message is, in the wintertime, the temperatures are about the same. But in the summertime, they're getting warmer. So that's an interesting thing. So the annual cycle is increasing. So the summertime is getting warmer. Um, this is actually just a, 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 an illustration, which is not something that I put together. Uh, but I wanted to say that there was a study by Zhang uh, et al., 2017, that projected that the snowfall at the summit uh, will be one-tenth of the current value. Not completely gone, but in, at 2100, it looks like it's going to be uh, less than, than uh, we currently have. Sea level temperature here is not expected to go up too much, a degree maybe. But aloft uh, at the summit, we're looking at a three degree temperature increase. And most of that's happening in the summertime. This is dew point temperature, uh, and, the, and it's getting moisture. There's going to be more moisture in the air and one of the questions which I still have to address, even though I've got a final report now, I'm going to give this to Stephanie, but there's still a couple of lingering questions that I want to answer. One of them is, is the moisture increase at the summit something that has a strong diurnal signal? In other words, during the afternoon, it's moist because you get an enhanced circulation, and I'll explain a bit about that later. And then at night, it's still going to be dry, uh, because you have downslope winds at night. That's basically the, the mountain uh, valley circulation and the sea breeze circulation together. This is integrated precipitable water. But what does that mean? That is the amount of moisture in the atmosphere totally condensed to the ground as liquid, and then you measure it. And in this case, it's measured in inches. So it's just a measure of how much water is in total in the atmosphere. And you can see there's some interesting excursions here. I think this is a hurricane in the model. And, uh, and I, I've been looking at that, and it, 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 that's what it appears to be. This one over here is a cone low. So you can actually see weather events that are producing these uh, wild spikes and, and, and craziness. And uh, the, the basic uh, message is that 
wintertime, precipitable water will be about the same, but summertime, it's going to be higher than the current climate. And the problem with that, the question with that is, is it going to be higher at night as well or just mostly higher during the day? This actually helps answer that question a little bit. This is the windrows, and it basically tells you these are east winds over here, these are west winds over there, and uh, uh, the quantity of the wind is given by um, how far out it is. So you can see 13%, so 13% of the time you're going to have easterly winds here. And the color indicates the wind speed. The color scales are not identical. This is the model projection for the future. This is the current situation. Uh, and you can see they, they, they map pretty closely in terms of the wind direction. So the large scale wind circulation pattern is going to be similar, but what is striking is that the wind speeds are going to be less, um, mostly less than about 10 meters per second, which is 20 knots. That's actually not a bad thing for astronomy. Uh, you you want to have winds that are kind of in the in the five knot, two and a half meter second range uh, for astronomy. Light winds, not no wind, but light winds. <coughs> Over here, we see that the winds are stronger. Uh, certainly, quite a bit stronger. During the daytime, if you have light winds, that means you won't have. Uh, a, a trade wind that is knocking all the hot air away and you will tend to have a stronger uh, sea breeze circulation. And so th that's my thought that this, this indicates lighter winds and a bit of a stronger sea breeze circulation, potentially. Uh, this is uh, January winds, uh, more westerly winds in January than currently uh, and this is the windrows for September. And in September, we have more easterly winds. And again, in all cases, the wind speeds appear to be less. This is the number of rainy days. And I don't have a, a, a map of how many rainy days there were currently, so it, it's a little bit hard to assess this. I think that the, the change is, uh, is not great. I think that the amount of rainfall is going to be similar. And what about snowfall? That's, the, that's an interesting question. It looks like we're going to basically in the summertime eliminate the snow. We get snowfalls now year round. Although any substantial snowfalls that, that really impede uh, operation at the summit is, is restricted to times when you have big storm systems like uh, Kona lows, cold fronts, and so forth. And those usually happen in the winter time, which is what you see here. This is the winter time. Uh, so summertime, it looks like, and this is not my work. This is uh, from another paper that is just coming out where they did a study about snow and, and uh, this is where we have that comment that the, the number of uh, millimeters of snow is going to decrease on an annual basin, basis and uh, be pretty light in the, f in the future. But this is 2100, so it's taking it even further into the future. Now, what about the cloud layer? Here is an illustration of that trade wind inversion and what it does. It, it eliminates deep clouds provides a cap. And you can also see here that winds aloft are moving in the opposite direction. That's the Hadley circulation. So you have air coming from the equator moving uh, one direction and air coming uh, at low elevation that is moving towards the equator. And that's the Hadley circulation. Okay, so you have this orographic lift, which produces a cloud base, and then you get the trade wind inversion. And in between those two, you have this uh, cloud layer. And using radioson data, this is looking at some observations now, the trade wind inversion was found to occur about 82% of the time. 80, so roughly 80% of the time we have a trade wind inversion, which is why we're all kind of familiar with it. 
And the average base height of that trade wind inversion is about 2,200 meters. So I have trade wind inversion and I've got lifted condensation level and from that I can get the cloud layer depth. And what I do then is I look at the cloud layer depth in the, in the area of the island where we have the uh, cloud forest and try to figure out what's going on. So this is summertime and what we have determined is that the uh, cloud base goes up a little bit and the trade wind inversion comes down just a little bit in the summertime and you end up with a thinner uh, cloud forest. <coughs> that's, that's the result that we see from this. In the case of the wintertime, um, the cloud base goes down a little bit but the trade wind inversion actually goes up a little and in this case our cloud layer is a little deeper than currently. So it's interesting. In the winter overall, slightly thicker. In the summer, slightly thinner. Uh, in all cases, it appears that the cloud base is dropping a little bit. And that's consistent with sea surface temperatures coming up slightly and having more, a little bit more moisture coming in. So, conclusions. And this is all uh, relatively hot off the press. Summit temperatures will be warmer, especially in summer, and the summit will be moist, more moist, especially in summer and uh, during the daytime. Winds will be lighter, fostering stronger di diurnal su circulations, uh, the sea breeze circulation type thing. Trade wind inversion and cloud base will be slightly lower, um, and the cloud layer will be thinner in summer and thicker in winter. So, uh, and then I've got a couple more slides, just, I put in my pre-order. <laughs> what can we do about this? The, the answer is, ride a bicycle. It's, it's just a problem that there's so much gravitational potential energy to have to overcome in Hawaii. In other words, we have so many mountains. I was born in the Netherlands. It's absolutely flat there. And my bike is somewhere over here, but I can't remember. This is a train station in Leiden uh, where I was uh, taking a sabbatical. And for your amusement, uh, just a really nice comfortable chair. You sit on it long enough and it forms to your body perfectly. <laughs> and I hear that they're actually taking an iceberg, they're, they're talking about doing this now, an, big iceberg from, from Antarctica and bring it into the Persian Gulf and uh, it's a pretty crazy idea but maybe they can create chairs <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's for drinking water right anyway I'd be happy to entertain questions or if that was thoroughly confusing I'm not surprised yes does the vlog have any effect on the brightening Ah, that's an interesting question. The VOG pretty much stays below the uh, trade wind inversion. And if we, if we can get the VOG through the trade wind inversion with a bit of mixing, we might see more of it at the summit, given lighter winds and stronger diurnal cir circulations. It's an in interesting thought. Thank you. Two questions, should we see? One, um, you showed a chart that showed um, forecast uh, frequency of major storms in the future. It wasn't obvious to me why there are going to be fewer storms south of us with a warming sea surface temperature everywhere. I can understand why more storms over Hawaii, but not why there are less storms south of us. That's a, that's a tough question. Um, I, I would say that that has to do with the Hadley circulation, changes in the Hadley circulation, and the tendency for the whole storm track to move north a little bit. 
Currently, there are very few storms that form south of Hawaii because we don't have we have we have these confluent trade winds in both hemispheres that, that form this intertropical convergence zone, and there's no vorticity in that, and so very few storms form south of Hawaii anyway. So the storms that come to Hawaii are coming from the east. They tend to form near Mexico, and they travel a long distance, and the, it allows the weatherman to be able to say, okay, you know, here's Storm Bertha, and you know, weeks and weeks later, it'll come and hit Hawaii, which is very, uh, very nice and helpful. That we get a lot of uh, advance notice. The as the storms are moving, what's happening is is they're seeing more and more wind shear near Hawaii, and they tend to fall apart, and they also tend to kind of veer to the north. That's that's typical. Uh, hurricane pattern because of the conservation of uh, angular momentum uh, of the of the of the planet planetary vorticity it makes them move to the north anyway so storms from the east tend to come and they move to the north and they fall apart near Hawaii because of the uh, this this uh, shear wind shear so I'm thinking that um, in the future with maybe a slightly less strong Hadley circulation will have a little bit less wind shear, so that's one thing. The temperatures right now to the east of Hawaii tend to be a bit too cold to, to support good strong hurricanes, but if in the future that if the temperature is warmer, you'll get more. So I think that that's why there's this, this increase around Hawaii, combination of wind shear and temperature. But why it decreases to the south, I'll have to look at that. Yeah. Sorry for that long and rambling qu answer. One more for you. Oh, we had an email exchange last week about the tides and the anomalous tides that yeah. we've been used lately, which is kind of scary. I know. It's so what's going on with the tides? Well, you cannot blame it on astronomy. No. <laughs> well, you can't blame it on, well, you can't. on me. <laughs> you, well, you can, kind of. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, it, it's it's a little bit outside of my field because this is oceanography, right? Uh, but I did ask Chip Fletcher about this, and he's he's the man that seems to know a lot about beach erosion and stuff. And he says, yeah, it's kind of normal that every once in a while, you know, you get you get a higher sea level over a certain part of the ocean basin, and it has to do with a combination of currents which tend to pile up the, the, the water, and also sea surface temperature, or ocean temperature. The warmer the ocean uh, temperature, the, the, it expands a little bit. And you actually have variations. Uh, previously, the, there was a lot of high water over the western Pacific, and islands were actually being swallowed up. And now that we had this El Nino, and, and we've got, had a lot of warm water that kind of has, has moved north out of the El Nino. And I think that that is part of the explanation. It's warm water plus currents that are just creating locally. And, and what's interesting to me is that it's so uh, extended, you know, that it, that it lasts for months and months. It's like a whole year of high tides. And I think it's going to be a problem for the the king tide or the, the ac extra high tides in the summertime. And surfers are complaining that their favorite breaks are not breaking where they used to break. And About six to eight inches. Yeah. The ocean level has in the past few months come up around the water, which is huge compared to what we're talking about from the climatology scale. I know. It is, it's absolutely huge. Really yeah. Really I've never heard of before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it, it'll be interesting to see what happens in Waikiki this summer when we have the high tides, and if we get a good strong south swell, we're going to start seeing some serious flooding, and that uh, portends things to come. <laughs>